All right, hello and welcome to our eighth CARS webcast of 2021. My name is Brad Bell. I'm the William J. Kennedy Professor of Strategic Human Resources here in ILR School. I also serve as the Academic Director of our Center for Advanced Human Resources, or CARS. It's a pleasure to have you joining us today. It's also a pleasure to have my uh, co-host for today's session, uh, Susan Beauregard, joining us. Uh, Susan is the Executive Director of our Executive Masters in Human Resource uh, management program here at Cornell. Uh, she is uh, formerly a uh, HR executive at General Electric, so it's great to have her joining us today and sharing her perspective on this issue of cultural fault lines. You know, certainly in the past year and a half, we've experienced not only a global pandemic, uh, but also civil unrest and political strife, among many other disruptions which have created unprecedented stress and divisions, not only at home here in the US, but also around the world. The polarizing features of these events has really been intensified by the fact that many of us have been isolated from our work environments, where in the course of our day-to-day -day lives, we're often exposed to a variety of different viewpoints and opinions. Instead, we felt we found ourselves having to process a lot of conflicting information, news, and opinions, largely in a vacuum. Uh, or sometimes avoiding the conflict altogether by seeking out challenges with like-minded people. The result is that opinions and emotions have first further calcified, creating really steep cultural fault lines around the world. Over the past several months, Susan and I have had many conversations about these fault lines and really have started to explore how organizations can best navigate them. Our interest has been sparked by conversations with HR leaders we're worried about what it will mean when employees start to return to the office and bring these beliefs, emotions, stress, fears, political points of view, as well as their pandemic isolation with them. We have also been prompted by news stories of organizations that have taken very different approaches to navigating some of these challenges, from banning certain discussions altogether to really embracing them and having open forums and dialogues with their employees about different difficult conversations, whether it's about race or politics, etc. So with that background, we're really excited about today's session in which we really want to kind of share some of what we've heard already about these cultural fault lines and how organizations are experiencing them and trying to address them. But also we really want to use today's session to pick your brain and hear about what you're seeing in your own organizations and some of what you've found maybe early on has worked or perhaps not worked in your own context. So we're going to start out by sharing some background just to tee up the discussion. Susan's going to dive into some observations and insights that have come out of some of our early discussions with HR leaders. But then again, we want to shift attention to your experiences and observations. In today's session, we'll be using a uh, tool called Poll Everywhere, which will allow you uh, to share your uh, experiences and observations through a number of questions that we'll be presenting. Uh, when we get to the polls, we'll give you uh, information about how to log on and share your responses. You can do so either through uh, another web browser or through a text message, whichever, whichever is most convenient to you. I wanna highlight up front that the polls are completely anonymous. Uh, so we really do encourage you to share and share openly because nothing will be tied to you or your name or anything uh, like that. Throughout the presentation, we also encourage you to share any questions that you might have or comments that uh, may come up during the discussion. Uh, you can use either the chat function or the Q&A function here in Zoom uh, to share your questions uh, and comments. You know, over the past year, we've seen many headlines about the tensions and conflicts that are spilling over into the workplace. As this kind of sample that you see on the screen here demonstrates, the sources of these conflicts are quite varied, ranging from political differences to remote work preferences, support for the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, as well as vaccine mandates being just a few uh, examples. A recent article by Anna Shields that appeared in Forbes noted that workplace mediators have noticed significant changes in the nature of conflict at work uh, during the course of the pandemic. One of those differences is that over the past 18 months, there's really been an uptick in conflict between employees and their employing organizations. 
And here we see in these headlines, many different examples of how that's manifested. The tech firm Basecamp, for example, attracted uh, quite a few headlines over the summer when about a third of its 60 employees decided to exit the organization after their CEO uh, announced in a blog post that employees would no longer be able to share their societal and political discussions at work. Uh, and as you can see by the headline right below that one, uh, you know, certainly many people thought that was a flawed strategy uh, and one that other organizations should maybe avoid uh, in the future. Similarly, we saw earlier this year that Apple employees pushing back after CEO Tim Cook announced plans to have employees return to the office for at least three days a week starting in September. The pushback was not only about employees wanting more flexibility, but also really more about the fact that they felt ignored. They felt like their voices were not heard and that these decisions were being made top down without really the input and opinions and views of the broader employee base being taken into consideration. And finally, we've seen a lot of employer, employee employer conflicts emerge in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement. Some companies, for example, have banned employees from wearing buttons and other attire showing support for the movement, which has sparked pushback from employees leading some organizations like Starbucks to reverse course uh, and others like Kroger Brands uh, to face NL NLRB challenges uh, here going forward. The rise in employee-employer conflict has been attributed to a number of different factors, but one of those is really kind of a shift in employee priorities during the pandemic. People over the past 18 months have really reflected or haven't had an opportunity to reflect on what they want from work, what they want from their employers, and how they want to see their own values and opinions reflected in the places in which they work. And may, going forward, not be as willing as they were in the past to kind of sacrifice their own needs and values. Certainly the record staffing shortages that we're seeing now have also shifted the leverage to employees to have much more uh, impact or a stronger position in order to stand up for what they want from their employing organizations. In the Forbes article, Shields notes, however, that not all of this conflict is between employees and their employers. Uh, it's also occurring within teams between employees as well as increasingly between employees and customers. I'm sure that all of you over the past several months have seen many signs like these uh, when you've been out, maybe at restaurants or other stores and locations, you know, reminding us as customers to be patient, uh, to be kind, uh, and to recognize that due to the staffing shortages, uh, things might not be as seamless and quick as they once were. You know, such reminders might have some demonstrable effect in short-term interactions with service providers. However, these types of reminders may be less effective when we're dealing with employees who are having intensive, ongoing relationships with their coworkers uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. There's some evidence also that our traditional approaches to managing employee conflict may not be as effective as they could or should be. A recent survey of employees in the UK, for example, found that 83% feel that people in their organizations are not heard fairly or equally. Another recent survey found that when employees discuss a conflict issue with their manager, HR, or their union representative, only 43% report that the problem was resolved. In short, these and other data points have prompted our interests into really digging into more how, digging more into how can companies manage these cultural fault lines at work and what might be some of the new approaches that we need to address these conflicts as we begin our return to the office. As I mentioned previously, we've started to have conversations with a number of different HR leaders, uh, which have revealed some interesting observations and insights at the early stages of this work. So I'm gonna turn it over to Susan now to kind of walk us through some of those insights. And when she's done, we'll then turn attention to getting some of your ideas and opinions. Susan? Great, thank you, Brad. So a couple of things, this is certainly real. And when we brought up this topic with the executives, the HR executives who are part of our master's program, 
this was a very lively topic because the experience was so common. You know, just some of the stories that we've heard, which may resonate with some of you, um, an urban emergency room dealing with the workforce's reaction after the police shootings this summer, you know, trying to balance the demands of the workforce to advocate on behalf of the community with the very critical relationship that that emergency room has with the local police. We heard of a, from a hotel saying basically employees did not want to work at a particular political event, so they canceled the event only to get a huge backlash from other employees who challenged that they were not a political organization. Why did it happen? We had another example where a gay producer did not want to work on developing content for a company that was overtly anti-LGBT. Um, other examples, you know, how will a company react when things affect their bottom line? And I recently heard the um, CEO of American Airlines talking about two incidents that they dealt with. One was would they or wouldn't they speak out on voting rights? and deciding to make that statement, but then a couple of months later facing backlash from their employees after restoring political contributions after the January 6th uh, suspension of those contributions. And then of course, there were some ones that are really, as Brad mentioned, employee to employee, where people were going to local school board meetings, having huge arguments there and having that carry back into the workforce the next day on Slack and in the break room and in other ways. So, you know, does it really matter? Does this stuff stick? If you look at the sociologists and some of the research we looked at, senses of differences between teams, of course, tend to undermine trust. They do uh, modify behavior and team performance. And we've seen resignations coming out of this, out of these disputes. Whereas on the other side, similarities do reinforce job satisfaction. They're a huge employee value proposition where people feel they belong. The other thing that I thought was interesting from some of the sociology is that where there's stress around other topics, people then become reluctant to engage even in business discussions that are difficult, that have nothing to do with those outside issues. So in looking at how this is happening, one of the things people are looking at in companies is, well, why is this happening? It really goes back to people's innate need to belong and connect. And that sense of belonging and connecting is only made more important to people when they're experiencing isolation and anxiety, then they really want to feel that sense of belonging. And during the pandemic, the things that are normal, the cues that tell people things that are normal, like being in the office every day, riding the train, you know, going into restaurants, those were gone. And all that's heightened and it's heightened at work, the differences at work as well. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is many of the filters are off. People are feeling less need to be politically correct on things. And as a tipping point has happened on a couple of issues, People are not stewing alone on something they observe. They're kind of shouting together, including at work. And of course, the battle over misinformation of all kinds on all sides only fuels this. So it's really come down to a couple of things that help us address those issues that companies are undertaking. There's sort of six actions here. One is providing very strong, renewed messaging on the company position and values. So we see people doubling down on that because that begins to establish a group level goal, a group level sense of membership that will transcend some of the local and more subgroup memberships in there. And the other thing that dialogue is undertaking is to what's called cross-cutting, which is to say we have more in common than we have different differences. And so what the way that's happening is Southwest Airlines, for example, promoting things like civility and kindness as a cultural value and really pushing that. Um, Kaiser Permanente started pushing the culture of us so that the people begin to look out for each other and begin to overtly think of that as a group that they want to be part of. I've also heard a lot of companies are now doubling down on a stream of information that's relevant to their business needs so that it begins to provide context for decisions they might make, but it also helps counter some information that may be overbalanced in a direction that's not helpful to them and is important. Another technique for that doubling down is I, this interesting Sesame Workshops leader during the pandemic wrote a weekly note to employees about what was on his mind, what was he thinking about, again, as a means of providing insight into a perspective and a point of view that they might not otherwise see. And of course, I, I thought interesting too, is how do you provide a new tribe, more common tribes that cut across and companies are reinvigorating things like volunteerism committees in their group hobbies and other social groups that again, provide a different set of boundaries. The second thing that was interesting, I think from our executive group was to step back and say, what skills do our leaders not have that are required in this new climate 
And it really came back to, are people skilled at having conversations? Can they really, do they go into a, a discussion or a meeting just trying to force their point of view? Are they skilled at bringing fact-based dialogue, listening and really exploring through uh, context, understanding context of where someone's coming from, asking questions, and also, of course, facilitative leadership with all the time pressure and hurry and the sense of the Zoom meeting, things tend to get a little bit maybe too expedited. So they're teaching facilitative dialogue and listening. There's also teaching dispute resolution and de-escalation skills. When you think about it, most managers never are formally trained in de-escalating, but that may be most important, that first 30 seconds of a conversation and how to be effective. I also saw some interesting things on manager skills from an MIT study that talked about being more task oriented when a group is difficult rather than being more team building oriented. It was a bit counterintuitive, but the theory is in a social setting, a team building setting, people will go on what they already know and gravitate to people they already know. In a task oriented environment where the manager focuses on everyone's contributions, they begin to recognize each other's skills and values beyond just belief systems that they may assume. The other thing, the third technique that we see, and this I think is interesting and challenging, is setting up these forums for dialogue. Brad mentioned this, these safe spaces where people can actually take on some of these political or social issues that are laying underneath of all the daily work and talk about them. The real success factor there has been to have facilitators to make them very much voluntary for people who are interested in participating. And of course, setting up a lot of ground rules that people commit to in order to participate in the conversation. For example, being vulnerable themselves to considering that maybe their position isn't the only position or the right position and to make space for new ideas, things like taking winning off the table. So these are carefully cultivated dialogues. There's some um, General Motors is doing this target uh, General Mills has a courageous conversations program and that's very interesting. And Allstate has a better arguments program that they're running with the Aspen Institute. Again, trying to build trust and empathy and skills, frankly, because those skills and those will translate back hopefully into day-to-day -day behaviors. The fourth area is really engaging carefully on social issues. And it's interesting, the Gartner study recently uh, showed that 87% of employees feel businesses should take a position. And even when they're not directly related to their business, they were 11 times more likely to respond positively if that position reflected values that they understood, but they were six times more likely to be negative if they thought the message was hollow and didn't have any actions associated with it. So this also becomes a, you know, a very landmine potentially, but potentially a very powerful way to engage with your workforce by taking that position. The fifth area we heard about was really taking a good look at workforce standards and enforcement in light of this whole new climate. So Brad mentioned political talk and clothing, uh, use of company resources, how will you deal with employee actions that are reported to you that take place outside the workplace? Do you have a policy? And also customer standards, what will you enforce about customer behavior when they're interacting with your workforce? We see it in a retail setting, but other students have reported to us settings in, in industrial settings, delivery docs, everything else. And finally, of course, the, the sixth area is testing the impact of this tension on internal processes. We've seen increased reports of real, and, and who knows if it's real, but perceived impact based on political beliefs or social beliefs or alignments, and also feeling that shun or cancel culture that may be going on in your climate. So other companies are starting to think about that. How do we test that? How do we make sure that this is not creeping in to our shared processes. So Brad, I'll turn it back to you for the polling, but those are some of the areas of feedback that we've been exploring and like to hear about. Great, thanks Susan, great summary. Uh, obviously a lot of interesting insights already out of the early stages of this work, but we're sure that there's many more things that are uh, happening in your own organizations that we'd love to hear about. Uh, this is early stage work for us and we'd like to continue it uh, going forward. And so again, kind of getting uh, a bit of insights from you today would be really helpful as we look to shape some of this uh, future work. So as I mentioned at the outset, what we'd like to do is uh, use the kind of Poll Everywhere platform uh, for kind of picking your brain a bit on what you're seeing in your own organizations. Uh, so to participate in these polls, uh, what you need to do is 
either log into a web browser uh, on your phone or on your computer uh, at pollev.com backslash Brad Bell, or you can uh, text my name, Brad Bell, uh, to uh, 22333, and then you'll be kind of in the polls. And for each of the questions that come up, you'll just be able to submit uh, your responses. So we'll start out with uh, what I think is hopefully an easy one, uh, but really kind of curious to hear uh, about whether your business has experienced some of the workforce tensions, clicks, or negative events uh, that we've been talking about that are really kind of enforced or reinforced by these strongly held uh, differing opinions. So if you have, you can uh, submit A, and if not, please uh, indicate B. I see some results uh, filtering in here, which is great. So we see the responses coming in. So it looks like pretty strong majority uh, have, have experienced uh, some of these issues that we've been referencing, which is uh, in, in line with what I think uh, Susan and I would have expected. Kind of curious about the 30% that haven't experienced any of this. Maybe it's because everyone's still remote and you're not back in person, or uh, maybe there's something else about your organization that's meant, allowed you to uh, you know, avoid some of these issues. i uh, be really kind of curious to hear more about that. But let's uh, move on to the next question. It's kind of digs a little bit deeper into these in terms of what you're actually seeing. So we're curious to hear about if you've experienced some of these clashes, you know, what topics or issues have served as a source of these various conflicts within your organization. So you can just type in a word or two. Uh, the responses they come in should show up as a, in a word bubble. So vaccination status seems to be a big one. Return to work, mass, racial, we see here, justice, voting, voting rights. It's great. So clearly, vaccination is still, looks like the, the kind of dominant one here, which is clearly a very salient one. And I think also, uh, has some connections with some of these others like politics, I think, uh, and some of these other topics. So not surprising that's kind of a vector that's showing up. Great, so let's go on to the next question here. You know, are there any other issues beyond the ones that you just listed that you expect may show up when your workforce is fully back? Or maybe some of these ones that you highlighted, you expect them to become even more salient or more of a fault line when employees start to come back into the office on a regular basis. Again, a word or two. Well, I like the one inequity and working flexibly. We've certainly heard that from a lot of organizations in terms of who has the opportunity or the, the freedom to kind of work hybrid or fully remote versus those that might for work reasons have to be in the workplace. See flexi type work as well there along the same lines, following protocols around related to the health and safety topic. And so it seems like building on the last, you know, in addition to these issues that we've already seen, a lot of it's gonna be around return to work policies and practices 
uh, safe return to the office as well as flexible work going forward. We just had a, one come in, uh, upskill and training, interesting. Maybe in terms of who has access to those opportunities or, or not. Great. So kind of moving into the you know, solutions, I think you know, Susan shared a number of ones that we've heard again early on, but kind of curious what you've observed. Have you seen any effective strategies for handling these clashes and maybe within your own organizations and maybe what you've seen in other organizations, uh, but we're kind of curious in terms of what are some of the effective approaches that you may have may have observed. I'm not seeing any responses yet. Maybe that means there's no effective approaches. <laughs> yeah, that may be the answer, Brad. <laughs> Mediation, all right. So back to the fault lines that may exist around, you know, having to be in the office versus remote, maybe a, a more hybrid approach allows us to bridge some of those differences. So kind of interesting comment, doubtful about its effectiveness, but transferring conversations. <laughs> But employee listening and regular communication on vision and strategy. Absolutely. So a lot here about communication around the transparency, listening, having these open forums as Susan talked about for having these discussions. Great, so let me, curious on the flip side, anything that you've tried or maybe you've seen others try that hasn't worked? Uh, things that maybe we should avoid going forward? That's it. <laughs> I think that goes to the kind of policies uh, and practices that you were talking about, Susan. Yep. So that's interesting, kind of a top to bottom, top down. I think that saying kind of a top down mm -hmm. strategy really needs to be more maybe bottom up or, yep. or bi-directional. I think going back to the earlier approach of having these forums and, and opportunities for dialogue and voice. And training managers to be more comfortable with that two-way mm -hmm. communications, yeah. Yeah. All right, so I know we're short on time here, so I'm gonna go on, let just have two more questions for you. Um, seeing work from home is not working, uh, absolutely. We have a couple more kind. So back to some of these distinctions between work models and how that might create fault lines. I think we were previously thinking about is you know maybe the people working from home were the privileged ones because they had that opportunity, but there also is also the risk that maybe they're seen as not as committed, not as productive uh, while they're working from home. And certainly if we're gonna have a lot of conversation and dialogue and listening, we need to follow up on that with action. A lot of research says the worst thing we can do is ask for voice and not listen or do anything about what people tell us. Great, so last question, I'm kind of curious about 
leaders in your organization, where do you think they're at currently? How well equipped do you think they are to handle these clashes and conflicts when they arise? So if you think they're pretty well equipped, ready to go, you can select A. You think some are well equipped, but you know, many are well equipped, but there's some that maybe aren't quite there, B. You think there's a few leaders in your organization that you know, can handle this, but many quite aren't, aren't quite prepared, that's C. And if you would say most are not well equipped, select D. All right, so it seems like the kind of dominant response here is some are well-equipped, but many are not. So there are some leaders that just based on their skills, experience, you know, are prepared for this, ready to handle it based on their, you know, style perhaps, but many are not and, and need the kind of upskilling and training that, that Susan was talking about. So one final question for you, and then we'll be wrapping up. So what are your thoughts around, you know, to the kind of upskilling or training piece, do you see can particular skills or capabilities that you think would be particularly important for leaders to have in order to address these issues? Or maybe if you're thinking about the ones to the prior question, you'd say are well-equipped, what do they have that maybe other leaders don't? that makes them well positioned to handle these issues. Listening skills, great one. Interesting. Hmm. It's a lot about listening, empathy, Defining clear vision and expectations, which is interesting, right? Because I think some of these we would say it's have always been strong leadership skills, team leadership skills, defining a clear mission, vision, expectations. But I think even more weight being put on the listening and empathy pieces. Clarity of verbiage, I like that. What is hybrid? What are we really talking about? And explaining why someone maybe is in one type of work model versus another. Susan, any reactions to any of the responses that have come in before we wrap up? No, I, it's certainly very consistent with what we've heard from the companies that we've spoken to, for sure. And I do think uh, no surprise around the leader skills. I think leaders would actually welcome some training around some of this because they, I, I know I would be concerned if it were coming at me every day, I'd want to be sure that I was equipped. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. This is very good and interesting. Yes, thank you all for your responses. Very helpful for us. Uh, I think we're out of time, so we're going to kind of skip through the, the comments and questions. I, I do see some things that were put in the chat as well, so we'll certainly capture them. Uh, appreciate those comments. Uh, just uh, as we wrap up, I want to highlight some upcoming CARS events that uh, hopefully you'll put on your calendar. Uh, we have our last uh, CARS cast of the year coming up on November 9th, uh, which will be on uh, talent management during the post-pandemic transition. So we've been doing a series of working groups this semester on different uh, talent management issues and challenges, uh, enhancing the employee experience, uh, retaining uh, talent, reducing the attrition that we've seen uh, in recent months, adjusting learning and development, et cetera. So we'll be summarizing the findings from that series of working groups on November 9th. Uh, so I encourage you to join for that. And then we have our fall partner meeting, which is going to be focused um, also on post-pandemic talent challenges and opportunities. So we have two of our uh, student research groups working on projects focused on talent attraction and retention, as well as total rewards, looking at how companies are rethinking these different talent 
uh, processes as they transition into the post-pandemic uh, normal. So I encourage you to sign up for those events, share them with others in your organization. You can also always find our events and register for our events at our website, uh, which you see uh, listed here at the bottom of the slide. So with that, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I'd like to thank Susan for joining us and sharing all of her insights. And again, hope to see you at one of our future events. Take care.